In comparison to some of the uh, warmer climates, it's very true. We don't have the consistent problems because, fortunately, we still have freeze, all right? And that's a very good thing in many cases. All right, uh, so uh, it's not like I like looking at myself, but I was told I had to put a picture on there, all right? Uh, but anyway, uh, this is kind of the outline. We're going to talk about coarse defoliators. I'm going to need your help with that. You'll see what I mean. Uh, certainly the uh, suckers and then they uh, end up with the uh, pod feeders. And I'm also going to throw in a little bit of educational value here that I think you'll appreciate. So I'm going to start off with, I'm going to call it number one. All right, and uh, the issue with uh, bean leaf beetle, now if we were doing some kind of training here where we had to do insect ID and you're going to be tested on this, uh, I would be saying, look, notice that it has different coloration. Not all of them have stripes, and, but all of them have this black triangle. Ha! I snuck that one in on you. Okay, now you've been trained, all right? Uh, so that's the bean leaf beetle. Okay, so uh, why do we care about the bean leaf beetle, and why do I think it will be with us throughout our time of growing soybean in the Midwest? And simply because it's native here already. And it was uh, before we were here, it was feeding on wild legumes, when the pioneers got here, it was feeding on the uh, green beans. And then, of course, in the 20s, 30s, soybean came in, and they gladly took to that legume. So they're one of the first to feed out there because they overwinter as an adult. And, uh, and then they're going to get right to the soybean as soon as you have the first ones to emerge or your neighbors. All right. And uh, now... You already know that I'm talking about late season insects, all right? It's kind of like, well, why are you talking about here early season? Well, I'm going to get to that here in a minute. Uh, certainly, they feed then. Actually, the adult is with us two more times during the season, mid-season, and then late season, all right? Uh, but uh, I wanted to get to this right away uh, to clarify, if you will, a mindset. Maybe it's just Hoosier farmers. I don't know. But uh, all right. Now, what I mean by this is seed applied insecticides. All right, uh, specifically Cruiser, uh, because that tends to be more so on the soybean. So uh, where am I getting at? This is the label for Cruiser. You never see this, all right? Uh, this is in the, uh, actually on the seed tag, but uh, you don't read that kind of stuff. But uh, it does tell us that it's going to pick up these pests. And these are two that we're going to talk about here for late season. And I just want to make sure you understand where we're at as far as control with Cruiser and these pests, all right? So kind of setting the groundwork. And you didn't expect this today. Chemistry. Cool. I liked it so much I almost took it twice, all right? If you know what I mean. But uh, it is a relatively new class of insecticide. It went bonkers as far as sales, all right, because, and I'm not talking about just here, I'm talking about worldwide, all right, and, uh, and the neonics, uh, they're actually uh, closely related to nicotine, which is kind of cool, all right, and, uh, and then uh, I want you to take note that it's very, very soluble, the chemistry is, all right, so these molecules you're seeing are very, very soluble, thus they become translocated. So here you're putting a, mi a tiny bit on the seed, and then as soon as that uh, seed starts to imbibe water to sprout, it starts working into the system of that seed. So it's in the sprout root system, eventually, of course, in uh, the small uh, plant above ground. And then it starts to peter out, and that's where we're going to get at here. Um, <clears throat> one thing, and it's another whole PowerPoint presentation, but um, it is uh, short-lived in the plant, as you will see. But the uh, thing I want you to put in the back of your mind, because, again, that's for another day, is that it's very persistent in the environment, this molecule. And uh, primarily because of the uh, chlorine elements that are on here, and if anyone's ever seen the molecule for something like DDT, did, did I say DDT? Maybe you know something like chlordane or aldrin, all right? 
Remember some of those names, folks? Come on, some of you are old enough to remember. All right, uh, these molecules are very, very similar. It's kind of interesting. And we know what happened with those many, many years ago. All right, uh, so I'm going to leave that there. So this is some um, uh, efficacy. In other words, what we did was harvested uh, plants at certain growth stages. You can see all the way from emergence all the way to reproductive or flowers. And, uh, and then this is number of post, day or post days after planting. But uh, these are the levels that I want to show you of the cruiser, thiamethoxin. I didn't break that to you. But, uh, and you can see that they're very, very high initially. Again, take note of the growth stage. All right. And uh, matter of fact, this is early season, and we're not going to cover that. All right. But the point being is that here's this bean leaf beetle. It went to this soybean field because it was early emerging. It took one little bite on this cod laden. You can see it right there. And look, it's sleeping right there. All right. I think you know what I mean. All right. So it is very high in levels. And so for its intention right there, it worked quite well. But again, our, our goal is here to cover now the rest of the season. And you can see for bean leaf beetle that we're going to have now uh, just about this time of season. And then later on, you can't even see, all right, in other words, when the pods are there, there is no efficacy for bean leaf beetle. So let's just get that out of the way. All right, and uh, graphically, we put this together uh, to try to kind of show you that uh, the levels of neonics are very high initially. And uh, again, as we see the bean leaf beetle, excuse me, I do a little adjust. And uh, as we see the beetle then uh, mid-season and then late season, this is our charge today, uh, there is nothing left. All right. So um, here we go. The... We already covered pretty much this dude here, but uh, Japanese beetle. Do you have Japanese beetle in Ohio? Really? Okay. All right, grasshoppers, green, you know, clover worms, all right, uh, woolly caterpillars, all right. Yeah, these have been around a long, long time. And uh, so, you know, they all do their bit of chomping. So what we're going to do now for the rest of the time, we're not going to take each insect, although... Let me show you this. This is kind of cool. Because sometimes I have to do detective work. In other words, insects are gone, but there's defoliation. Defoliation is that big word for leaf removal. Okay? And uh, each one of them had their little signature. Bean leaf beetle, typically little round holes. All right, Japanese beetle, it's kind of cool. It's pretty. All right? And then uh, green clover worm, they have big old gap and holes there. All right, and grasshopper kind of does the same thing, and woolly bear. But the point being is that uh, in the end, it's all combined as defoliation. That's what we're going to do together for the remainder of our time. All right, uh, so now we're going to go sample because we've got a uh, soybean that's pretty much covered canopy now, and uh, we're concerned because uh, as we're driving by on that field at 55, all right, we started noticing, uh, but look, it's just not right. And so what we find, of course, is that we've got some feeding going out there or defoliation. All right, uh, so what is our system here? All right, so in other words, we've got to guesstimate our defoliation. We get to do a little bit of that together here. Uh, of course, we've got to understand what stage of growth is. And uh, what we're going to do now is take some sweeps. This is cool. If you want some good exercise, this is what you need to do. All right? Uh, this is a pendulum sleep, sweep. Notice that uh, it's not bearing into the foliage, but ideally you're just hitting the tops of it because that's primarily where your insects are going to be, especially midday. And then, of course, you uh, watch all the little goodies that start kind of coming out of there. And uh, that's what we're looking for, the different insects, and is there a primary pest? All right, uh, so 
we want to be able to understand the life cycle. That comes very important because we may have the defoliation, but the insect may be long gone. I see this quite a bit with Japanese beetle. By the time the farmer is cued in on, we've got a lot of foliage feeding here, and uh, we need to spray, and you go out and look, and Japanese beetles start naturally dying off later in the season. So, uh, in other words, they're tailing off. Why spray them now? All right, uh, we're going to use this. This is really cool, this defoliation table. All right, uh, this is for our threshold. And uh, you'll see it again, but uh, briefly, we're going to go down stage of growth. And we've got two different uh, sections here. We've got a market price of soybean at $7 and a market price of $8. Now, some years... I get the comment, Obermeyer, you need to get that up, all right? And in some years I hear that uh, Obermeyer, that's too high. But uh, overall, on average, we're going to stick with this 7 or $8. And then this is the amount you're going to pay to treat, all right? So there's a cost of the insecticide, also application cost, whether it's you or somebody else. There's a cost there, of course. So... Let's go have some fun. Here we go. All right, this is when you participate. Is that allowed in this uh, school here? All right. Okay, good. All right, uh, so what I need for you now to tell me is the amount in percentage defoliation. This is a fun game, all right? So this is an easy one. So this is the time to speak up first, all right? Uh, what type of defoliation do I have here percentage-wise? Ten, five, three. Cool. I appreciate you working at this. All right. So if you said 2%, you were right on. If you said less than 5, I agree with you. All right. Uh, I think 10 was a little high. All right. Here we go. Ten, ten, seven. Okay. 10%. Excellent. All right, uh, here we go. Oh, <laughs> guess which? <laughs> Did you say 15.1%? Oh, that's the important thing. All right, uh, and then the next, all right. Yeah, this is when we get excited, isn't it? 50%, let's see. All right. You had to say 0.2%, all right? Uh, so uh, there you go. Now, is this fair? Because what we're doing right now, we've got a little leaflet, all right? A soybean leaf is how many? There's three leaflets to it. And we've just taken one little leaflet. This is too easy, all right? And the thing is, too, if you've got defoliation out there, you've got to do it as a whole plant or as a field. So here we go. Here's a plot, and this is early in the season, okay? So I'm, I'm stretching a little bit, but this is good practice. All right, so here it is. Early in the season. By the way, who wants to tell me what type of feeding is going on here? What culprit is doing that? Bean leaf beetle. Bean leaf beetle. Excellent. You learned something today, or you already knew that. But the uh, point being is, what type of defoliation we got going on here? It gets a little harder. All right, uh, let me help some. I'm going to take one of those plants out. Okay, here we go. I'm going to take one of those plants out and lay it out on the ground to help you spread the leaves, help you see. All right, does that help uh, determine or at least get to the defoliation here? 15.2. This guy's good. This guy's good. I like that. All right, uh, I think you were right in the ballpark, sir. Yeah. All right, uh, I got to get your name later. All right, be a consultant for me. <laughs> you what? <laughs> All right, uh, so here we are at seventeen percent. All right, do we care? All right, let's follow through. All right, remember we got to get the defoliation. Now let's do the stage of growth. Harold, I don't know why we're not cooperating with this thing. All right, here we go. Um, stage of growth. All right, uh, well, okay, 
here are the uh, unifoliates. We don't count those. So one, two, three, four, five. Do we count this one? Yeah, we do. They're no longer touching. That's six, V6. All right. All right. Uh, come on, baby. All right, uh, so here we are. On this table, once again, we, we already know our growth stage. What was our defoliation again? 17. Do you think we're even close on a treatment threshold here? Not even close. Look at these percentages when it's in the V stages. What do you see mostly? 40s and 50s, all right? I think you already knew that. Soybean, whether it's a hailstorm or animal, the cow gets out there or whatever, they can take a tremendous amount of defoliation as long as the plant's not stomped on and, of course, uh, come back pretty good. All right, uh, so uh, let's ramp it up here a little bit. Uh, different stage of growth, all right? And uh, here we have this defoliation. Anybody want to take a guess here? 10, 15. Did you say 15? Is that what you're saying? Actually, uh, all right, 4%. All right, uh, so there we are. Certainly a little bit lower. Uh, and uh, for some reason, the holes catch your eye, and that's what we want to concentrate on. But actually, you've got to try to remember that everything green, as far as leaf, is catching Photosynthates, all right, uh, so or it's producing. All right, so uh, here's the growth stage. What do we got? Does anyone know? It, you certainly see a flower. We have multiple flowers, right? All right, so uh, there's R2. And uh, where are we at here? Okay, we had about a 4% defoliation, and you can see that, uh, again, no, we're close on a threshold. All right, so here we go. One more. I know you're having so much fun. Right? Okay. So here we are. This gets a little harder yet. All right? Now, more foliage yet. You're looking at this. You're assessing, are we at a treatment threshold? And, by the way, what type of defoliation or what pest or insect now caused this? There you go, Japanese beetle, good. All right, uh, maybe it's just my other hand that needs to be doing it. All right, so a um, little bit harder here. Certainly you can see the pods on there. Any guesses, defoliation-wise? 10, 20, 30. Who give me 35, 35, 35? All right. Oh, come on, man. You got to work with me. Come on. All right. 26%. All right. Uh, so, what do you think? Are we uh, in danger or should we be treating? Close. We got to have growth stage, right? Because that's very important. And I know you all know that uh, here we have a pod that's over three-quarter of an inch long, so that makes it R4. I knew you were going to say that. All right, and uh, R4, 26%. Where are we at here? We need to smoke them, right? All right, what would be the exclusion here? Hey, amen to that. Thank you. Yeah. Are the beetles still actively feeding? All right, and that's certainly you need to assess. That's one thing why we're doing the sweeping, to determine that. All right, good job on that. Thanks for working with me on that. Uh, now we're going to move into the uh, suckers, because that pretty well takes care of the defoliators. All right, and um, now, here we're going to get into a situation where, well, let me advance on here. We've got some other little suckers, too. But for the most part, we're talking about soybean aphids and or, in unique situations, as you know, spider mites. All right. Uh, 
But these others occasionally contribute, but, uh, and you need a magnifying lens to see them because they're really tiny, but for the most part, a matter of fact, uh, I have never seen any of these be a factor as far as economic yield loss. All right, uh, so let's take a, uh, oh, what do you notice the difference now? Before I was showing you leaf removal and things like that, defoliator, defoliator, okay? We talked about the different ones possibly. But uh, what do you notice here? Here we have plants that are severely damaged by a sucker, but what's different? It's the coloration thing, right? All right. So what they're doing is they're sucking, so they're not removing that tissue. So it's a little bit trickier to pick this up. All right. Uh, so here's a field that's uh, actually at economic levels. It was a particular research field. Can you really tell it? No, you can't tell it. All right. How are you going to be able to find this? Yeah. Did anyone say scouting? Somebody say that, by golly. <laughs> yes, amen to that. All right, and uh, certainly, uh, again, that the uh, soybean aphid is, uh, interestingly, it, uh, what it does is it has a fine needle. Matter of fact, let me show you. Within this uh, sheath here, this mouth sheath, uh, it's a little probe, as you can see. But can you see the little darker line inside there? That's actually what enters into the soybean, and it actually penetrates between the cells, and that's where it starts sucking its moisture. Did you take a yeah, I did. Well, thank you, thank you. It's for sale. All right. <laughs> All right uh, but what I wanted to get a point across is. Uh, you really don't see their damage until it's way too late. Uh, and that's this particular point. Now, what you're seeing here is you notice that the leaves are discolored. They're kind of, uh, uh, what do you want to say, they're blackish color on them. And what has happened is so much of their honeydew, in other words, their poop as they're feeding, drops down into lower leaves. And that is a very sticky substance and will start to... Uh, the molds will start growing on there. What is the what looks like uh, snowflakes all over the plant? It's the carcasses, but it's a healthy population carcass. In other words, as the soybean aphid grows, it sloughs off its skin and drops it down below. And that's what you're seeing. So actually up above, on the upper leaves, they're going gangbusters, all right? But what you're seeing down below is the remnants, all right? Lots of poop and lots of sloughed off coats, if you will, all right? The party's up above in the canopy, all right? All right, so, uh, so now in order to uh, scout for soybean aphid, what are you going to do to me? You do nothing. I'm going to try that one. Okay. Maybe it's just me. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, we're on. All right, so now we're going to count aphids. It's a cool time. All right, uh, all right. So, work with me. How many aphids do we have on this leaflet here? Hundred. Any other guesses? You get tired on me? Come on, come on. One twenty-five. All right, I'll accept that. But uh, so one forty-nine. All right, one leaflet. You notice that, uh, too, we have some winged ones, so they're going to be moving on to the next plant or the next field and so forth. All right, uh, understand that we have a lot of natural enemies out there, and they need to be considered as we're out there counting. Are they doing us some good? I'm not mandated to put this slide in. Everyone's going, oh, those other things, those good things. No, these, these really are working for us, all right? That's why I put it in here. All right, uh, especially this introduced species, everybody loves to hate, all right, the Asian lady beetle. They do a heck of a lot of feeding on aphids out there. And, uh, and these other ones you don't see so much. All right, remember this? 
just again to make sure you understand, soybean aphids, when does that come on in our Ohio, Indiana, Illinois beans? It's pretty late. That's right. Matter of fact, what typically happens is they're pushed down on storm fronts, down from such as areas such as Minnesota, all right? They're usually brought down, of course, in the wing form. They get caught up in storms, that, and then they come down on our soybean here in the lower Midwest, if you want to call it. So in other words, as they come in, there is no cruiser left in the plant, and Typically, about R1, R2 is when we start seeing the soybean aphid arriving, at least what becomes economic. All right, so again, just understanding that even though, interestingly, aphid is on the label for cruiser, that might be good for people in northern Minnesota, and that's a whole different discussion we can have. But for us here, it does us no good. All right. And again, the, the graphic, just to show... This typically is when the aphids start coming in, and there is nothing left. All right, so what is our uh, scouting threshold? All right, as we're counting these aphids, the average per plant, I want you to be a little, you already have heard this many times over, I'm sure. Our example of the R4, if we were finding over 250 aphids per plant, what should we do? No, at or above 250. Yeah, yeah. go ahead and spray. All right, uh, I want you to take a note of uh, thresholds. All right, uh, so here we have, or this looks like textbook, doesn't it? All right, I just want you to try to understand that, uh, and, and you don't have to put this to memory, the academic injury level or the threshold, but I do want you to understand that Thresholds, you're actually predicting that something that's going bad is going to continue. All right? Whereas this is when you, as a producer, are actually losing money in that field, which you don't want to do, obviously. All right? So interestingly, the threshold, in other words, the prediction, is at 250. the actual number of aphids per plant is somewhere in the 800 to 1,000 per plant. Now, the reason we do it at 250 is because we want you to have about a seven-day period or a week that you can get out and treat. If we waited until then, 1,000 per plant, what happens there? We're losing yield. All right, uh, so I just want you to understand. So... In this example, the aphid numbers are building. We apply an application here at threshold. We knock them back. And, of course, they're going to continue to try to build back up because you're not going to kill them all, believe me. All right? And this is actually a very, this is how the system should work. All right? Utilizing scouting and then follow up with a threshold and then an action. And that may be doing nothing, and of course that may be uh, spraying them as well. All right, here's one that didn't go well. This example is, let's say we're going to spray a fungicide and hell's bells. Let's put in some pyrethroid because it's cheap too. And that's what I'm trying to get across here is, yeah, the aphids are out there, and probably defoliators as well. You're going to knock them back, but look, now we have more time for these aphids to get back to the point where not only are they going to reach the threshold for the first time, but uh, they're going to go beyond that. Because it takes no time at all for these populations to just go gangbusters. All right? So I just want you to understand that, that it, there's a reason we have these thresholds mm -hmm. and we don't want to be spraying at non-economic levels. All right. So here you go. Our favorite, spider mites. Start noticing something's going on bad here. 
All right, and then you look out in the rest of the field and you kind of see that it's, uh, it's looking dry out there. And uh, lo and behold, you look real, real close, and there's Mr. or Mrs. Spider Mite. I can't tell the difference. All right, uh, now, do you notice, as we look real close, too, that we have little pools of water here on the soybean leaf surface? I just want you to take note. Remember we talked about the soybean aphid inserting that fine needle-like mouth part between the cells? These guys are slobs, all right? The way they eat is they're just basically scarring the leaf cells, and eventually those scars, they first pool because it's just basically oozing out the moisture from that cell, and then, of course, it starts turning brown. And that's the discoloration you see, the bronzing that's often associated with spider mites. So in other words, you want to catch them at this point when they're just starting to do the damage. You start seeing the bronzing. They've been feeding for a while, all right? So some considerations with spider mites, and obviously I don't have any great solutions uh, because every situation and every year is different with them. But uh, hot and dry means we need to be looking for them, certainly. They're generally going to be showing up first in the end rows or t next to the road, all right? Many times I will see it because somebody comes along and mows this nice and pretty. In other words, uh, they got a few weeds that are popping up because the grass is nearly dead, all right? But they're mowing for uh, recreational purposes, I guess. But uh, that's going to drive mites further into the field. All right, uh, Understand, too, that a moisture-stressed soybean plant is a protein shake for them. So the drier that plant gets, the more, uh, how should I say, there's less water in the plant sap, and that becomes a greater protein source for those spider mites. So they just go crazy on that. All right. And uh, they certainly have increased egg production and then shorter generation time. So you can see how that cycle starts building on itself. All right. Uh, so when it's hot and dry, when do you think of fungus being a problem? Yeah. That's usually what we associate, let's say, the you know, foliar diseases when it's been very wet. Okay, so now we've got the opposite environment. So I want you to be thinking that uh, the uh, fungal population, which is natural, often will get spider mites as long as we have plenty of moisture, humidity within that canopy. And then, of course, when it gets hot and dry, that is lacking. When we get into the situation when it's starting to get hot and dry, and one goes ahead and sprays not only maybe an insecticide, but with that a fungicide, believe it or not, the fungicides meant for diseases on the plant will actually control the diseases to get the spider mites as well. All right. We call this flaring of mites. I've seen it time and time again. So you're combining the insecticide. What's that going to control? Well, it's meant to control spider mites, and it may control a lot of them. But unfortunately, it controls a lot of the natural enemies that are eating on the spider mites. And spider mites are able to rebound quickly in any type of situation like that. All right, so I just want to kind of throw that out as a you know, food for thought of the future, that uh, just, again, willy-nilly tank mixes of fungicides and insecticides, I've seen it time and time again where it's a mistake because you're upsetting the balance out there. And I know at this conference, there's a lot of discussion about the balance of things. 
all right? Many times it's associated with the soil, but what I'm talking about in the soybean canopy as well. All right, uh, this is one that uh, I kind of caught on. This is the 2012 season. Uh, you all remember it so fondly. But uh, I had some uh, plots intended for a different purpose, but I noticed something going on here. And uh, this is, of course, late July. This is our soybean, our three soybean. Our three are pods that are less than a three-quarter inch. So it's just really starting into the pod production. And then I'm going to fast forward here to early August, and you can just start seeing some stippling, some bronzing within the canopy. Go up one stage now. These happen to be planted right next to each other, so it was really cool to see this. This was our four growth stage. I saw much more bronzing beginning in this particular growth stage. And then, of course, at the same time period, you can see this plot has a problem with spider mites. And you even know that at this time. But yield has been lost here. All right. What I'm getting at is I had not seen this before where even just the growth stage makes a huge difference. So ask yourself now, back to 2012, why did my neighbor have so many problems in that given field and I didn't? Or it might have been reverse of that. Or why did this field of mine have so many problems and the one away over here didn't, et cetera? It might have been just a simple fact of not necessarily soil type, but it might have been the growth stage. And for some reason, the difference between R3 when it was attacked and R4 meant that protein broth within that plant sap that I was talking about a few moments ago is what spurred on that population. All right? So again, just another little element. We don't have a good handle on that. We don't have that built into a threshold, but I think it's very interesting. So what are we going to do about spider mites and how are we going to know? Um, again, typically you're going to see from uh, next to the road where it's starting to, uh, roadside where it's starting to burn up. And uh, you're going to start <coughs> seeing this movement into the field. Obviously the scout here is in the wrong place because it's, you know, this is long gone here. He needs to be out here, right? out where there's still some good beans, all right, and determine whether or not they're there. How are we going to sample for that? Uh, you just simply shake some soybean over a white piece of paper or whatever you have with you at the time and uh, determine whether or not those little specks are moving around. I don't know if you can see those or not, but uh, that's the little spider mites going to town. So a very healthy population there. All right, uh, so what do we do with that? Again, we don't have a neat threshold like we do with, I think, defoliators. So with the, in this case, these suckers, it's going to be um, considerations for the, uh, of course, the forecasted weather. All right, is it going to remain hot and dry? And uh, consider, again, this nutritional effect within the stress plant. Population increase is just way beyond our comprehension with spider mites. If conditions are perfect for them, it's just crazy. All right, and uh, this is really neat. Uh, I saw this for the first time in 2012. Uh, I read about it in textbooks. And that's how are they getting around? How are they getting from field to field or plant to plant? All right, and uh, they are closely related to spiders, so they do spin a little web. Uh, this, you can't tell so much here, but this leaf is just covered in webbing, all right? And they all start congregating here. It's kind of cool, isn't it? And then they throw out one of those little webs at their tail end, and you can see one little dude here, and soon the wind will just, boop, take them away, all right, to wherever, all right? Might be a brick wall, but it might be a soybean field, all right? And... Uh, and sometimes they can go quite a distance depending on the gust of wind. All right, uh, so 
Treatment decisions, again, uh, I want you to be considered about, you know, consider when it's starting to stipple, not bronze, because we already know that uh, there's been a lot of damage by that time. And uh, you're going to be sampling in areas that aren't showing any damage. See if the population is there and healthy. And uh, certainly, you, this is a biggie. For some reason, Hoosier producers think that a uh, one-inch rain will kill them. And there's nothing further from the truth. What a one-inch rain will do is recharge the plant sap dilute it for a while, and it won't be that, if you will, protein shake within the plant for a while. All right, if it gets off hot and dry again after that one inch rain, then it's, you know, we're resetting. So in other words, I just want you to understand, they don't go away with some rain. Do they get washed off the leaves? They will get washed off, some of them will. Remember, they're on the underside and they have that webbing. So they are... They're pretty well protected, but yes, some of them will get washed off or knocked off. If they get to the ground, they're probably goners. Sometimes whenever that rain comes, it cools off for a while. Yes. So you don't and if it, if it stays cloudy, which is a good thing because that canopy will likely stay moist, what will happen if we keep a nice moist canopy for a few days? Amen. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, Let's finish it up with uh, pod feeders. Uh, there seems to be more and more concern about this uh, uh, because I think that uh, yield has been a big driver, but now we're also getting into quality issues, especially when we have some of these uh, different types of soybean, you know, even food grade. But, uh, and this is especially important for those that are producing soybean for seed. All right. Uh, all right, so here's the perfect scenario where you're going to have a lot of pod damage. This may be your field, it may be the neighbors, but uh, you've seen this. This one's all done. It's waiting for the combine. But look at this one. It's starting to get that color, especially in these green areas. We're talking about insects that are very, very mobile, and they will go where they want to. All right, and specifically, I'm talking about uh, the bean leaf beetle. Here we are, back with that beetle late in the season. How much neonic uh, is left in that plant to control them? Yeah. All right, uh, here's some little plots I had. Um, it, it's a little confusing at first. Let me explain. So this is the number of beetles per sweep, right, with the sweep net. You saw that. All right, and this is when I sampled. So here we are later August all the way up to early October. And uh, all of the beans were planted with a mid-group three on these particular days. All right, you can see this is your typical planting dates, some in April, certainly. But uh, the point being is, really, we had quite a few beetles in the August. All the sampling, or excuse me, all the planting dates and you can see the trends kind of follow each other, but what is one thing that becomes very obvious late in the season? This mid-June planting became that field that was still green that I just pictured for you a moment ago. In other words, those beetles are moving over there because it's kind of like, hey, fellas, it's green pasture over here, all right? And that's where they're going to feed because they haven't gone into overwintering yet. All right? They need a lot of food now to get them through that wintering process. Uh, here is, uh, I showed you the bean leaf beetle. Here's the pod feeding, these same plots. Again, the uh, planting dates. And notice that the bean leaf beetle sweeps now are kind of insignificant here, but they start being quite noticeable here and that later planting date, but more importantly, look at this trend line here with the pod feeding. So more times than not, they're going to move to the fields that are either late planted or late maturing. There is a difference there, all right? 
So in other words, uh, if your field, for whatever reason, is still green in comparison to all the neighbors, and I'm talking about soybean here now, of course, that's where bean leaf beetle, grasshoppers maybe, will be going. All right, so that's where we really get into the pod feeding type situation. Uh, what are we going to do about it? Uh, we have a pretty good threshold with it. You go out and look. You actually count the number of pods that are being damaged, so get somewhat of a percentage out there. And if you're anywhere close in that 5 to 10% range, and what's very important element here? Oh, you're, you're falling asleep on me, all right? What's very important here? We got 5 to 10% feeding, but what? Yeah, are the bean leaf beetle or whatever, are they still actively feeding? All right, very good. All right, and of course, uh, well, you've seen or at least heard of messed up beans because of their feeding. They actually don't feed on the seed itself, but they feed on the, the, uh, the green tissue of the pod. And what happens is that cracks open. I don't have a good picture of that right here, but uh, that cracks open and allows moisture in. And that's where really it gets messed up. All right, uh, Emerson mentioned stink bugs. Fortunately, we don't have a huge amount of stink bugs, although there's get, starting to get a lot of noise uh, from my southern Indiana uh, crowd, especially real close to the Ohio River, maybe even some Kentucky folks. Uh, they're seeing a little bit higher populations, especially with the green stink bug, not pictured here, but next. Uh, so is this a trend? Okay. Will climate change, global warming, will that continue to cause stink bug populations that I often associate with uh, Mississippi? All right, will that tend to creep this way? Perhaps. We just don't know that. Here are two brown species. Um, uh, this one, uh, the brown stink bug. I love that name, brown stink bug, okay? And uh, it's been around, I mean, it's indigenous to this area as far as we know. But the brown marmorated, you've heard about it. Uh, it's new, all right? And uh, we've seen some... Uh, uh, higher numbers with this particular pest, but not at the advancement that we saw, let's say, out into the uh, East Coast, uh, where populations just went on this continual trend upward. We're not quite seeing that here. All right, uh, this is an example of brown stink bug, or excuse me, brown marmorated stink bug. And uh, just uh, this is what we're concentrated on here. All right, and... Uh, revealed its damage because it's inserted its beak in and just sucked the fluids out, all right? And uh, you can see where that uh, damage is on another pod and the hole right in where it was feeding. All right, and here's the green stink bug. I just want to make sure that you understand that, uh, by the way, uh, if it's brown, it's called a Brown stink bug, pretty cool. Or it could be the brown marmorated. But if it's green, it's a... Green. See, entomologists, we don't have a lot of imagination, do we? It's just... Anyway, uh, but uh, take note, too, that uh, would you dare call that a green stink bug? What is it with those nymphs? They're so pretty, all right? They really can't be damaging, can they? Well, they do. They're, they're feeding just as much as the adult, if not even more, because these are teenagers, and you know what teenagers do with food, all right? All right, so uh, how do we determine whether or not our stink bug uh, situations? Again, I'm pretty much talking about timing issues. The brown, or the, any of those stink bug species are going to go where the pods are. They really like this R5 to R6 range where the beans are just coming on here, but uh, nice, I mean, these are butter beans here, and they love feeding on those. All right, and uh, again, we're going to sweep and determine what we got out there. And you saw the numbers, about 40 stink bugs, 
all right, in a hundred sweeps. So it takes quite a few of them to really cause the damage. But again, it's something we're watching, this trend. I've uh, been fortunate to work with uh, some colleagues uh, way down south in the southern states and uh, getting some good information from them. But we don't have the populations here in the Midwest that they do down there. So, all right, uh, did I, I think I left a minute or two for questions. And Any, any final comments? Yes, sir. Speculation with stink bugs is, yeah, as we tend to warm up, or in other words, the trending line is upward, it seems as though the stink bugs are moving this way. But we still don't have some species that, let's say, Mississippi, uh, Alabama, et cetera, has that, uh, unfortunately, for that. They have a red shoulder that is really nasty. It's here, but it's not in populations. So uh, and with the Asian lady beetle, I think that you, you were asking about that thing is just kind of up and down. We introduced that uh, in Georgia for uh, pecan aphids uh, back in the, I, I don't have the figure in my head right now, I think it was in the 80s. And uh, boy, that thing swept through the, uh, the country. I mean, you can find it in every county of the, the whole United States now. But uh, anyway, so uh, that they come and go, but they are often directly associated with what the aphid populations are. So you got a lot of soybean aphid, you'll probably have a lot of Asian lady beetles. And those trying to get into your house that fall. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, uh, I, I probably didn't make that uh, point strong enough, but uh, the impact of natural enemies is, uh, and there's several of them, obviously, is with a synthetic pyrethroid because it's a general purpose or, if you will, broad spectrum insecticide. It will knock back their populations at a greater percentage than it would the pest that you're targeting, whether it be aphid or spider mites or what have you. And, of course, we know that the pest, uh, because of the conditions, they're there for a reason, and uh, the conditions are that they will, in other words, flourish once again, whereas the natural enemies take much longer to catch back up with them. Did I answer your question, sir? Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. The aphids, uh, they, are, they also have fungal diseases that get to them. But um, uh, the only time I've seen it actually take uh, root is when I had some soybean aphids uh, on plants, on leaves, sent to me overnight in a Ziploc bag. And the moisture in there was so heavy that by the time it got to me and I opened it up, they were pretty much dead from a fungal disease. So it was kind of cool. But the point being is they were quite healthy when they were put in the bag. Uh, does that answer your question? I've not seen it in the field where the, the population is just wiped out overnight. Well, one time I looked at the field that had quite a few of them, and I went on vacation for a week, and when I come back, they were all dead. There was Yeah, you're living right, man. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> I like that. Dan? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Dan's asking about uh, how does the threshold change when the pyrethroid to spray out there, general purpose, just in case, uh, is so low. And the point being is, yeah, that does affect the economics, but what I'm worried about is the biological activity that can't be put into the formula. All right, so an economist can't put in what I was just talking about with the natural enemies. You know, the influence, the negative influence that the pyrethroid has on those and uh, it versus the, uh, maybe the short-term control you might have with soybean aphid, for example. So thanks for asking that. Hey John, yeah.
Oh, my. Uh, I know we've got to wrap it up. Uh, good question. Uh, I, I think the way I'm going to answer it is not answer at all. In other words, I'm going to say I'm an IPMer. I believe you scout. I believe you determine a threshold. If you've exceeded it, you spray it. I'm going to keep it at that nice and simple right now. Adding in an insecticide just in case. I think we disrupt too many things. And I know I'm in a mixed crowd here, but uh, for the many that understand it's a complex system out there, and for us to just go out and spray a broadcast or a broad spectrum insecticide, I think is a huge mistake. So thank you for asking. With that, let's thank John. All right. Thank you very much.